All right. Well, uh, happy Wednesday. It's our last uh, lec lecture together, and because uh, on on Friday we won't have uh, we won't have lecture, but uh, I'll be on campus uh, for kind of extended office hours. I guess nine to noon. Uh, I'll just I'll just be sitting in my office. I'll probably be writing, working on writing the exams and, and things like that, or surfing the internet, whatever. Um, let's uh, let's start by going over this uh, final exam description, and I'll answer any questions that you have about it. Um, okay, so um, yes, uh, we have it uh, scheduled. Uh, for Monday, March 14th, 6.30 to 9.30, it will be online, okay? Do, do I have that? Yeah, sorry. Uh, synchronous proctored via Zoom. So it's, uh, it's going to be an online exam. Uh, exam is open note and open book, um, and you can use uh, any of the notes uh, created for the class, and you can use uh, any of your own homework uh, submissions. Uh, you can also um, search the internet, but only, I guess this is, we're, we're going to have to go on trust and, uh, and, and honor here, but I think you can get all of, uh, pretty, pretty much everything that you're looking for through the kind of reference manuals, reference docs. So, um, so you can, you can use Google to search these things. And so for example, you can go to the Python language reference. And, uh, and it will take you here, okay? And if you wanted to, uh, um, if you want to search, all you, you can do something like insert item into a list, and then what you'll do is you'll specify the site, docs.python.org, okay? And so this will pull kind of all of the the, uh, the information here, okay? And then see, usually your first hit, probably pretty good, right? Data structures, and then you see list.insert and things like that. So um, just use the, uh, use the option here for site, um, and you can do uh, docs.python, numpy.org, pandas.pydata.org, and matplotlib.org. Those, those would be your kind of four sites um, that, that that you can use. Uh, you know, I don't want you going on Stack Exchange or you know any of those types of sites that have you know questions and answers uh, set up uh, during the exam. I will uh, I'll, I'll disable Campus Wire uh, as well, um, and you know obviously don't don't copy and paste any of the questions from the exam. Okay, uh, and then I, I think this is clear, uh, but I'll also you know, state it here just so there's no confusion, you know, it, it is an individual exam, so you're, you're to work alone, uh, you know, don't, don't be uh, collaborating with other people, or um, yeah, that's part of the reason why we have uh, the Zoom proctoring, um, it's just to kind of make sure you're, you're working alone, um, you know, depending on your living situation, you know, it's fine if people are, like, existing in the background and stuff, but, you know, I don't want, like, People, you know, uh, working together um, on the on the test. Okay, and then obviously uh, don't don't share the uh, exam file with anyone. Don't distribute or or post it anywhere. Uh, even after the class is over, uh, you know, don't do that. And uh, and the way it's going to work, uh, it's going to be kind of like the homework in that I'll post uh, a Jupyter notebook, uh, a .ipynb file with kind of all of the questions and and whatnot in there, and then you'll. Uh, You'll have three hours to go through it and uh, and answer all the questions, okay, or, and do your best. And so, um, that's that's what we'll have. It's it's going to be a bit like the homework, just in a in a timed, proctored environment, okay. Um, so as far as topics that will be covered, um, it'll go up through week eight. Uh, nothing from week nine. Or week ten, so no, no, no SQL, no stats models, uh, no Scikit-Learn. Okay, and I'd say there's kind of two two parts to it. One will be uh, primarily centered around pandas, matplotlib. I guess NumPy th throw that in there because pandas is built off of NumPy. 
uh, and and you will um, you'll be doing some data manipulation, summarizing, visualization with uh, with those tools, and then uh, and then you'll also have some exercises that cover kind of Python programming with functions and classes. So as far as the data manipulation, summarizing, visualization, uh, there's there's a few lectures that uh, were we covered pandas and matplotlib. Uh, and basically for the, these questions, I'll provide a CSV file um, and you'll read it into pandas, maybe, a, maybe multiple CSV files. And I'll ask you to do um, several tasks which could involve uh, any, of, any of the following, um, you know, changing the index, creating a date-based index, uh, re-indexing the data and filling in missing values, maybe uh, removing missing values, uh, subsetting the data based on some kind of criteria, or you know, doing some kind of summary statistics based on groups, uh, creating new columns, calculating correlations between variables, and then kind of creating line plots uh, for either numeric variables or multiple numeric variables with legends, stacked uh, or side-by-side -side bar plots, um, and, uh, and I think this is, uh, uh, I do plan on doing something like this because I do think this is an important skill as I'll ask you to use some kind of function that was perhaps not explicitly covered in class. I'll at least name the function and you can go to the reference manuals and read how to use this function and, uh, and use it. Because uh, that's going to be very important is learning <laughs> like because obviously I can't cover everything within uh, within 10 weeks. So you'll have to be able to learn, you have to be able to read uh, a new function, at least something that exists in base Python or at least in one of these base, I, I call them base packages, but kind of like either in the pandas, numpy, base Python. Um, you know, those are all very well documented and you should be able to read documentation and figure out how to, uh, how to use it, okay? Um, so I'll at least provide the uh, the name of the function for you to do that, okay? And then, uh, and with all these things, uh, there might be some follow-up questions that ask you to kind of at least explain or provide some context to uh, whatever either w whatever the graph states, whatever the uh, summary statistics state, or, or something of that nature, okay? There's no um, no statistical tests. So I'm not going to be saying like do a t test to compare these these groups or something like that. It it's, would be kind of more, uh, if you had to think of this, it'd be a little bit like exploratory data analysis in that, you know, you'll you, just exploring some trends in the data and things like that. Uh, do you give a question? Yeah? Uh, I was just going to ask, is it um, like what we just printed on grade scope? Yes, okay. yeah, yeah. So you will, so I'll post a, it, the kind of the structure and like how you will receive it and submit it will be a lot like the homework in that I'll, I'll post the IPI and you'll download that you'll put in your answers you'll you'll save it as a PDF uh, and and submit the PDF to Gradescope you'll also submit your IPI and B to uh, Canvas yeah the date time package yeah so uh, yeah pretty much you can use I guess I'll uh, I'll list off the you know the packages you can use, but yeah, you can you can import math, you can import date time, you can import um, you know a lot of these. I, what I would consider just like <laughs> standard libraries that um, you know just don't get maybe not get called up. You, you shouldn't have to install anything new. Like there there shouldn't be a need to like, install some kind of. You know, I'm not going to be asking you to use like TensorFlow or something like that. Okay. Uh, any other questions? At least on the pandas and matplotlib stuff. Okay. And then the other stuff uh, uh, is a little bit more <laughs> generic, and and you can kind of look through, say, homeworks one through three for an idea of kind of the complexity of some of the functions, and then you know this. This most recent homework definitely it gets quite complex, so I'm it won't be as you know, especially like with the poker hand stuff. It's not going to be anything of that complexity. Okay, 
But if you, if you look through, say, homeworks one through three, there's a, there's a decent amount of um, functions that you had to write for those homeworks, and it'll probably be comparable to those kinds of things. Um, yeah, a little bit of kind of problem solving. You, you might have to think a little bit of you know how 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 to approach uh, a solution, and and I think the challenge to me writing this exam is figuring out how how long to make the exam so that it will be so that within the time period it's a it's a reasonable it, that it's a reasonable amount of time that that can be completed so um, so that's what we have okay so um, basically in in the second part I'll ask you to write some functions you'll take it you know they'll accept arguments you'll perform some kind of task and it'll output stuff um, you know, cover a range of topics, but I would say most of them, I, I would say it will be focused primarily with working with strings, tuples, lists, and dictionaries. Okay, so uh, this will be kind of the, you know, working with these, these types of uh, these things. Uh, I'll also have you create uh, a new class definition, and uh, and I want you to be familiar with using Python's double under methods, um, you know the the string less than add length get item those those types of uh, double under methods, which which I really think may, uh, make Python's object oriented model very powerful uh, in, in executing things. Okay. Any questions regarding what to expect for the final, or just logistics or, or any of that stuff? Okay. All right. So that's uh, that will be that. Okay. Well, um, I guess we'll take a look at today's uh, today's example here. Let me um, let me go ahead and give you your first view quiz answer for today. I've already forgot. I just updated it. But uh, oh, I do have a favor to ask, and I think uh, course evaluations are open now. Okay, so please uh, um, do take the time to uh, to fill those out. I hope I hope you enjoyed the course, or at, at least feel like you learned some stuff about Python. Uh, I welcome any feedback. Regarding, um, yeah, you know, I, I guess any aspects of the course, uh, you know, pacing, the content covered, the uh, the you know difficulty level of the assignments and, and all of that, um, I, you know, any any feedback you have, uh, I welcome. I do read uh, all of it, um, and and yeah, I, I can't, I, I don't get to read it until after I final file grades, so. Uh, so there's no like retribution or something if you write something <laughs> critical, um, but they do uh, they do help me out uh, in terms of improving the course and then also um, my I guess my career trajectory uh, is 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 due in part to uh, course evaluations. I, I've already, I I passed my first kind of uh, career hurdle I guess uh, at six years. There's a there's a formal merit review and. You know, they looked at my course evaluations, and, and in the past they were they were okay. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I appreciate your your taking the time to uh, to fill out an evaluation. Uh, let me go ahead and give you your first view quiz answer for today, which is the uh, the letter D D as in dog, D as in dog. I don't know how you guys feel about view quizzes and and whatnot. As a, I kind of was started doing this. Uh, as an alternative to attendance, um, obviously I, I, I like when you guys are here, uh, but um, I don't know. Just to also kind of make sure people stay up to date on on the stuff. I don't know. I don't know how it works, but uh, whatever. Okay. Uh, all right. So let's uh, let's go ahead and take a look. 
Uh, I thought we would do a little bit of uh, just some very, very, very basic stuff in uh, scikit-learn. And again, um, last on Monday, I, the very, you know first thing we did with scikit-learn was just learning how to do cross-validation and splitting your data between kind of a training set and a test testing set, which is kind of a, a fundamental idea uh, as far as machine learning goes. And and again, there's uh, so much stuff you can do with scikit-learn. It, it's, um, uh, it's kind of interesting, uh, especially if you compare R and Python. And, and so <laughs> these are my, this is my two cents on uh, the debate of R versus Python. Uh, so Python is a general purpose programming language. And so anytime you have a, a task, so I would say my answer, you know, which one's better, R versus Python, it's kind of an impossible, it's, a, it's an impossible question to answer. You know, it's the, everything is different. Uh, you know, they, they serve different, different functions and, and purposes, right? It's kind of like what's better, a, a sedan or a SUV, and, and it depends on what you're, what you need to do, right? They're, they serve different things. So, so Python uh, is is a general purpose language, and it can uh, uh, it can do a lot. Um, and and it wasn't it wasn't specifically designed for data analysis, but with the creation of you know pandas, matplotlib, uh, numpy, and all of these kinds of things you can do a lot of data analysis. And certainly the machine learning uh, tools, uh, especially scikit-learn and a lot of these uh, deeper learning um, softwares uh, such as you know, TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch, uh, all of those things um, are, are made possible and, and operate fairly, very quickly uh, on Python. Even though Python is not a compiled language like C or anything like that, it's, uh, it's still, um, I'd say the performance is quite good. Uh, that said, as far as traditional statistics analysis goes, I think it's very difficult to beat R with all of its kind of built-in functionality um, and kind of the tools and packages designed that give, I think, statisticians the, the pieces of information that, uh, that they want to, uh, to know. Um, as far as kind of the the communities, also um, in R, you have like thousands of different packages, right? There, there's also lots of different packages and libraries that exist for Python, but as far as you know, doing machine learning stuff, there's probably hundreds of different packages. A lot of packages kind of duplicate uh, some of the functionality of other packages, and then there's also kind of this own separate thing within R, the, the tidyverse that uh, that some people subscribe to, which kind of forms a bit of a unified framework there. Uh, and so that's interesting. Whereas with Python, you have, as far as your machine learning goes, I would say scikit-learn is truly kind of the the umbrella package the, the, the that everybody kind of centers around and, and works on. And rather than having all of these different things splintering or doing their own kind of functionality, everything's kind of unified in, in scikit-learn as well. So uh, it's different. Uh, I think it's good to be, uh, I mean, obviously I'm biased because I teach both R and Python courses. So I think it's good to, uh, to be familiar uh, with both languages. Um, and, you know, students ask me, you know, I often get confused when I'm switching between R and Python. And I think, yes, I do too, okay? It's, uh, <laughs> uh, that's just something you have to deal with. I mean, you know, depend, you know if, if you find work that uses one language, obviously you'll get much stronger in that language. Um, but yeah, switching from one language to the other, it's, it's always, you gotta stop and think for a moment. <laughs> um, uh, and there's so many times I, I forget. And, um, and using the internet and search engines is, is always uh, always useful. And, and there's no shame, there's so many times I have to just look up how to do the most basic thing, just because I can't remember, just like, like how do I change the colors of things on the histogram, right? And it's like, I can't, you know, 
the exact keyword and argument you, you, you forget. And, and so don't, don't worry about that. That's, that's like probably for the rest of your life. Um, and especially if you, if you stop doing it for like three weeks and you come back, you're like, what, what was, uh, what was going on? Okay. Um, so anyway, let's, uh, let's, let's load up, uh, some data here. So we'll load up NumPy pandas and mylehotlib are just standard packages. Um, scikit-learn has some data sets built in. And so we'll load up the, uh, iris data. Iris data is, uh, comes in as a bunch. A bunch is a little bit like a dictionary, except the values within the dictionary can be um, wildly different types. Okay, so if you take a look at the keys in the bunch, you have the data, which will be a matrix, a target, which will be a, a one-dimensional array like a vector, and then you've got uh, some other things, you know, the feature names and target names, the, the names of these things in it, along with the description. So if you just take a look at the data, these are the, uh, the predictor variables. And so the iris data set, have I talked about the iris data set in this class? I don't know. Okay, so, all right, let's, the iris data set is a, is a very famous data set and it's very popular among, uh, um, I guess, machine learning, for machine learning. And basically you have these four variables and they're all, they're numeric variables and there's three classes of three species of iris. So, um, so on the iris flower, okay, so, Let's see. Okay, so this is this is what an iris looks like, and there are petals. The standard, the petals kind of stick up, and then the part that falls down, those are the sepals. And depending on um, the species of the iris, there is uh, there's the Setosa species, Versicolor, and Virginica species, uh, and there's actually hunt hundreds of iris species, I believe. Um, the, uh, they, they took measurements of the sepals and the petals. They measured how long they are and how wide they are. And they kind of wrote down all of these things. And, uh, and so we, can, we might be able to classify them based on the characteristics of their sepal and petal length and petal width and things like this. Um, it was first used by, I don't know about first, but it was used by uh, Ronald Fisher Kind of the creator of the uh, the F test and F distribution, and um, you know a lot of these foundational ideas of hypothesis testing. Uh, when they did, uh, I think it was quadratic dis discriminant um, analysis. Okay. Well, anyway, these are the four columns. Okay, and uh, and we say, okay, well, what what are these? What do these columns represent? Well, the first column is the sepal length. And we have the sepal width. These are the first, those are the kind of the, the, the petals that fall down, and those are the, generally the larger petals. And then you have the, uh, I guess those are the larger things that, that fall, the, the sepals. And then the, the petals are the smaller ones that are upright, and, and we have the petal length and petal width, okay? And so we can see how, how big these are. These are measured in centimeters. And then as far as the target variable goes, there are three cl classes. Um, and the classes are Setosa, which will be class zero, Versicolor, class one, and Virginica, which is class two, okay, has a class label. And then there's a description of this, the, uh, the iris data set, and, uh, and we can see this is, it kind of, kind of comes with all of these things. Creator Ronald A. Fisher, and, uh, and this is back from uh, 1936, the use of multiple measurements in taxonomic problems. Uh, and it's, it's been a kind of a staple, especially in classification problems. Okay, so what we're gonna go ahead and do is we'll, we'll take, there's 150 observations in total, and what we'll do is we will split them into a training set and a test set, okay? So I'm gonna do the test size is gonna be 20% of my data, and I'm gonna stratify based on the target, okay? So what this means is 
As far as the, uh, the target goes, we have three classes, 0, 1, and 2. And if I'm going to take 20% of my data, so 20% out of 150 would be 30 observations, Stratify is going to ensure that I have 10 of um, Setosa, 10 Versicolor, and 10 Virginica in my uh, test set rather than uh, if it's you know at random I might have like seven of one and 13 of another or something like that um, so stratify will just ensure that we have um, the correct proportions of each in our um, our case and so just to kind of take a look at the resulting data um, we had 150 observations total so our training data will have 120 rows and four columns and uh, if I take my test data set, okay, I got uh, 30 observations of my test data set and we can see indeed uh, I have 10 of each each class. So bin count will do uh, tell you how many of each each thing that you have and so we have uh, 10 in each and that's what we have. Okay, the, uh, the first kind of classification thing that we will uh, do is a K nearest neighbors classifier. Uh, this is not a machine learning course, so the way K nearest neighbors will work, let me just show you a slide from 102B where I teach uh, K nearest neighbors. That's not it. <laughs> nope. Sorry. K nearest neighbors. Okay. So the way K nearest neighbors works is if this is, say, the current data here, okay, we've got two classes, red and blue, and here's a, a test case. The test case is right here. What we do is we we measure the distance, Euclidean distance, from our test case to every single other point to figure out how, how far, how, how similar or dissimilar this observation is from other observations. And the, the idea being, if the distance is small, it's similar to that observation. And if the distance is big, it's quite different from that observation. So, um, and what we do is we pick some arbitrary k, maybe k equals 1, or k equals 3, or k equals 5, or k equals 7. And if you have k equals 3, it's going to look at the three observations that are closest to your test case. And, uh, and each observation gets a vote as far as which class it belongs to. So in this case, this observation is gets two votes for red and one vote for blue. So this, obser this test case will get predicted as being class red. Okay. But on the other hand, if we do uh, k equals 7, the seven closest observations are these seven observations here. And we have four votes for blue and three votes for red. And so if you had k equals 7, this observation would get predicted as being blue. Um, whereas, uh, so over here, this, this is kind of on the clearly on the red side. And so if you do k equals 1, it would get classified as red. k equals 3 is still red k equals 5, k equals 7, this, this observation is going to get classified as red. Uh, and the thing is, is um, it's Euclidean and the distance is measured uh, using Euclidean distance. And our data exists in four dimensions. So the example I showed you was for two-dimensional data. But now you can imagine in some four-dimensional hyperspace, you know, you have a point that exists in four-dimensional space and you're measuring still Euclidean distance to another, to basically every single other observation in four dimensional space. It, it's hard to visualize because we can really only think in three dimensions, I think. <laughs> I don't know. Are, are you, does some, someone have a good way to visualize things in four dimensions? Uh, I don't know, but it's just, uh, you know, you can, you can imagine in three-dimensional space, you can still measure things at Euclidean distance, right? Change in x squared plus change in y squared plus change in z squared. Uh, yeah, those have square root. Okay, so anyway, um, we have four, uh, 
four predictor variables, and here I'm going to use Seaborn to just create a pair plot. And, uh, and here we have this, this thing, um, which looks uh, almost identical to what we have here, just with different colors. Okay, and um, so we have this, and we're going to just kind of take some observation, okay, and, uh, and measure its distance to every other point. Okay, so to use a k-nearest neighbors classifier, you import from sklearn.neighbors, import the k-neighbors classifier. And anytime you want to do something, you can always just do sklearn k-nearest neighbors and in uh, the, the first hit almost, whatever, whatever you type in will be how, how do you go about using something like this, right? So sklearn.neighbors.kneighbors classifier, and it will tell you some of the, uh, the arguments that you want to use. And then you've got other um, related things. And then if you're also uh, not sure, um, you can kind of go through, as far as supervised learning, this is, this is what classification would be. Um, you can see what, uh, what options we have. You also have naive bays. You have uh, decision trees, which would be kind of like your, um, you know, uh, that, that would go inside a random forest type of things, okay? Um, so you have, uh, and then, well, random forest is technically an ensemble method of multiple decision trees, um, hence the name forest. But anyway, we're just doing the k-neighbors classifier. We're going to say I want n equals 5 classifiers, okay? And so I'm going to just do k neighbors classifiers, n is equal to 5. We'll go ahead, and if you print the object, it just says this is a k neighbors classifier. And so to fit the data, you just give it the training data, and then uh, for the predictors and the target. Okay, so x is the predictors, that's the 4 by, or 120 rows, 4 columns. Y train is my vector of 120 values to predict. And, uh, and that's it, we, we fit it. And then we can say, okay, now that, and that's it, that's it, we fit the model. Now that we have this model created, KNN, we can use it to make predictions for our test data, okay? And so remember, test data, we have um, different observations, it's randomized. And we can say, okay, how well did our predictions perform versus the actual value? So we, we have the actual values so we can measure how well it performed, okay? So, so here we can see, okay, when it was the actual value was 2, it predicted 2. When the actual value was 0, it predicted 0. And we, what we see is, uh, for the most part, there's, it matches. We do see a mismatch right here. Uh, here the actual value was 2, and it predicted a 1. And I'm trying to see if there's any other mismatch between uh, this row of predictions and this row of actual values. Uh, one thing we can do is we can create what's known as a confusion matrix. This is a quick way to kind of just see if there's any mismatch between the, uh, the two things. And so what the confusion matrix will do is it's going to put uh, the actual values in the rows and it's going to do the prediction in the columns. And what we want to see, what we want to see is we want to see uh, values along the diagonal and very few values in the off diagonals. So this means when the true answer was 0, it predicted 0 all 10 times. When the true answer was 1, it predicted 1 all 10 times. When the true answer was 2, it predicted 2 9 times, but it predicted 1 1 time. So we have out of 30 observations, or 30 predictions, it made one mistake, which, which is pretty decent. Um, and, uh, and so that's, that's one way um, we can do this. So this is using the confusion matrix function, which is part of the sklearn package uh, under metrics, metrics for kind of measuring how, how our model is performing, okay? That was using uh, five nearest neighbors. We can say, okay, well, how, how will it work if we have one using uh, the one nearest neighbor? So I'm gonna create a new k nearest neighbors classifier called knn1. We'll do a We'll fit it on the data, and then I'm just going to go ahead and straight to make the confusion matrix between the actual values and the predictions using the one near, nearest neighbor, and uh, and we end up getting the same 
same prediction performance. Okay, what if I use the 25 nearest neighbors, okay? So one nearest neighbor is going to um, have a problem with overfitting, and, uh, and 25 nearest neighbors will have uh, a problem with not being responsive enough. So with 25 nearest neighbors, we end up making two predictions, um, or two mistakes uh, out of 30, and uh, you can kind of, so you might say, well, how do we, uh, how should I know if I should use one neighbor, two neighbors, three neighbors, you know, how many neighbors should I use? And so you can, you can manually do this. It's not very hard, but you can automate the parameter search using what's known as a grid search, CV. So CV being cross-validation. And we're going to use cross-validation to measure the performance across the different possible parameters. So as far as k-nearest neighbors, uh, a big question is, yeah, should you use one, three, five, seven, usually some odd number. Uh, um, it's not required, but odd numbers are almost the, uh, the thing. But I mean, we, we can just try uh, a whole bunch of things. So what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to try a grid search between 1 through 50, uh, 50 neighbors, OK? And then as far as the k-nearest neighbors uh, goes, there is another um, argument uh, where you can specify the weight of the neighbors, OK? And the idea here is, you know, here uh, each observation gets the same, like, voting power in that we have seven observations, four are red, and three are blue, and so it's four versus three. But you could say uh, um, the ones that are closest to the test point, those votes count more, and the ones that are far away count less. Okay, so that's a that's another kind of idea that was applied for the k nearest neighbors um, is to say the ones that are closer to the uh, test case, those those votes get higher value. The ones that are farther away get lower value. And, uh, and so that, that would be um, performing uh, using a distance weight uh, as far as making our predictions go. And so we could say, well, should I uh, use, you know, one nearest neighbor, or I mean, well, one nearest neighbor uniform and distance doesn't matter, but, you know, or should I do two nearest neighbors? And if I do two nearest neighbors, do I uniform votes or distance-based votes? Three nearest neighbors, uniform votes or distance-based votes? And we're going to go ahead and uh, and create this uh, grid search, okay? And we'll do um, we'll measure our performance using fivefold cross validation. So we're going to have our k nearest neighbors classifier, and what this will do, grid search CV will do, is it will automatically run the k nearest neighbors classifier using basically every single combination here. So we've got 100 different models that it's going to try out, and uh, and we'll. Uh, um, we'll see how it's uh, how it's going to perform. Okay, we're not going to use um, the uh, the test data at all. We're just going to go ahead and just uh, apply it to the training data. And so it's run, it ran through uh, one hundred um, or yeah, uh, I guess oh forty nine ninety eight different models from one through forty nine, not uh, not fifty one through forty nine. Um, weights are uniform and distance. We can say, well, which are the best parameters? And it said uh, 13 nearest neighbors uniform. And what was its prediction? Well, 98%. And so, <laughs> so we ask, OK, how well did it did perform on the training data? And it looks like it made two mistakes out of 120. So I guess that's OK. And then we could see, OK, how well does it perform? <laughs> its performance in the, uh, the test cases still ends up being it still makes one mistake. So there, this this one observation just might be like there's some, there could be something quote unquote wrong with the 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 flower itself, where it's like it just exhibits properties where you know anybody else might be confused and say like yeah it looks like it's this species, and it's not necessarily that your model is performing poorly. It's just um, this one observation might be difficult. Okay. Assuming this is the same observation that's confusing all of these things, um, but anyway, it, it again it ran through kind of all on that 198 different models to to figure that out. 
and uh, and so that's uh, that's how that works. Okay, um, you can also just ask. Okay, what what is the cross validation score? Here we're going to do uh, thirteen neighbors, neighbors uniform distances uh, or uniform weights is the default. So I'm not going to bother specifying that. And uh, when it does the cross validation. So with five-fold cross-validation in our training data, we have 120 observations. 120 divided by t uh, five is 24. And in three of the five scenarios, it got 100% correct. And in two of the five, uh, it made one mistake. Okay, so one mistake out of uh, 24 observations is like a 90, 95.8% accuracy. And so, um, so it scores across the five different folds is, you know, 96%, 100%, 100%, 96%, and the average of all five is 0.9833. So that's that's how it's getting at this cross-validation score. When we said, you know, KNN cross-validation, what's the best score? And it gave us 0.9833. It's basically um, giving you the score for each of the five folds and then averaging them to give you give you its overall score. Um, how many view quizzes did I give you? Just one. Okay, let me go ahead and give you your last two. The letters A as an apple. A as an apple is your second one. And then the third one is C as in cat. C as in cat for your third view quiz answer. A as an apple, C as in cat. Uh, okay, Gaussian naive bays. Um, I don't have the time to explain this, <laughs> but... Uh, um, but it, it's also a very good um, classification model. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. As far as I can't, I can't explain it in three minutes here. But basically, it's uh, it's fitting a normal distribution to uh, kind of the the parameters of each of these things. So if you look at the Iris data set, it's going to kind of fit uh, an ellipse around each of these clouds, like an ellipse around the uh, the blue cloud, an ellipse around the green cloud, and an ellipse around the red cloud. And wherever you put the the test observation, it's going to kind of say like which which of these uh, ellipses does does this observation look like it belongs to, and uh, and it uses a, a Bayes Bayes probability um, to to figure that out. Okay, so anyway. You can just kind of say, hey, make the predictions. Uh, how, how well does it perform? It performs the same, at least for for this particular um, thing. We can do cross-validation. Its overall performance is, uh, I guess, 95% uh, over here. We didn't have as good of performance for the cross-validation, but uh, but that's that's how that goes. OK. All right, well, we'll go ahead and uh, and call it a day here. Um, and I guess that's it for the uh, the quarter. For, uh, for lectures. So it's been a pleasure uh, being your teacher. I hope you enjoyed the course. Um, if uh, I, I do ask, ask you the favor to fill out your course evaluations, I'll be around on Friday to kind of answer any for office hours. If you just want to stop by and say hello or if you uh, have any questions about any of the material, uh, I'll be there. Um, other than that, good luck as you study for your final exam. And, uh, and I guess... I will see you online on Monday, um, and hopefully we'll uh, encounter each other in the in the future as well. All right. Well, thank you, everybody.